We'd like to say good evening to those who have joined us for our midweek Bible class at St. James Cumberland Presbyterian Church in America, located in Decatur, Alabama, at 920 West Moulton Street. We are blessed to have a chance to share the Word of God, realizing that we can't do it on our own. We solicit the presence of God as we open up His Word. And we're grateful to him for inspiring people to write this roadmap for us to live in this present existence. So we've been studying the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. And we finished it, but we wanted to lift up a few principles that he stressed in this particular letter that I think is very relevant to us today as we walk this Christian journey. So we ask that you pray with us as we try to do a, a brief review. We're gonna to try to finish this up today and, and move on to other areas of the Bible. So let us pray together. Holy and everlasting Father, the one who rules earth and heaven, our sovereign creator, Lord, we seek your presence as we study your word, Father. And Lord, we acknowledge, Father, that we are flesh and we are limited to what we can do in the flesh, Father. And Lord, we know that it's in you that we live and we move and we have our being. All of our help comes from you, Father. So Lord, we solicit your presence, Father, as we study your word, Father. And Lord, let your word have its desired effect in the lives of those who you want to touch up and let it be a blessing to us all. We thank you for the, for the opportunity to speak for you, Father. And Lord, you speak through me. Let me just be the instrument that you talk through, Father, that we all might receive a blessing from your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, we've been studying this letter that Paul wrote to this church at Colossae. And it was, uh, this church was founded by a man by the name of Ephesus who heard the gospel preached by Paul in Ephesus. And the theme of this book is one of the principles that we want to lift up. This church was a new church and it had Jews and it had uh, people in the area uh, who were all mixed in together with the Gentiles and and we bring our life experience into the to our new Christian faith and these these Jews wanted to bring how, what they had been taught uh, through Judaism into and mix it into this grace that they had received and and uh, the the people in the area were Oriental people and they wanted to bring in their Oriental beliefs and mix it in with this new grace that they found and then you have people who were well learned and they wanted to bring in their philosophical thinking into and their reasoning into this newfound grace. But the theme of this book is Christ's preeminence, his preeminence. What do you mean about preeminence? It means that uh, John, the third chapter in uh, verse 31 says, he that comes before, from, he that comes from above is above all. It means that he is superior to anything that we can reason or think. So he is preeminent. He is, uh, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, uh, it, is, it describes Christ by the it's, He's the Word. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. 
all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So you can't put anything above uh, its creator. If you make something, it means that you are above what you made. Romans 14 and 9 said Jesus both died and rose and revived. And he was made that he might be made Lord both of the living and the dead. So Christ had a mission that he had when he was on this earth. Yeah, he was um, our creator. But then he's the first fruit of them that slept. What are, you, what are you talking about? I'm talking about we lost everlasting life when we sinned in, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there was a tree. There was a tree of life in that garden. And we've been, we, we, we're trying to get back to that. When we sinned, God drove us out of the Garden of Eden and he put seraphim with flaming swords to keep us from the tree of life. But Christ came to give us access back to the tree of life. Uh, he died. Now, now, there were many other people who died and was resurrected. Lazarus stayed in the grave for three long days and, and uh, he brought his deteriorating body back. But then Lazarus had to die again. That, there was a woman that had a son who, uh, she was a widow, and she had only one son. And, and Christ touched the coffin, and the son was restored back to uh, this mother. But this boy died again. Dawkins, uh, she was a woman that had many, they called her Tabitha, had many great uh, contributions that she made to the people in, the, in her area. And when she died, the people were very sorrowful. But she was resurrected, but she had to die again. Christ, though, gave his life. He died, but then he was resurrected. He had a body that was a resurrected body, one that will never die again. He is the first fruit. He, he, he's, he's the first person. He was, he was all God and all man, but he, and he never sinned. And and he he died and and but he was he was resurrected and he was he, and he's the first fruit of those who will never die again and it's in him that we live move and have our being so he is the God of the living those of us who are still around right now and those who have passed on he has preeminence he's he has he bought our part he gave us eternal life. So someone who gives you eternal life means that he is preeminent. He's, he's above all of us. Even though God has given us uh, sainthood through him, even though God has made us and, in, and given us an inheritance through him, still he's the one that made it possible. So he is preeminent. Uh, he was made so much better than angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Christ created the angels. Heaven and earth he created. He was with God, creating heaven and earth. So the angels are less than Jesus because he created them. The angels never experienced this life that we're living. They've always been around the throne of God. So he is preeminent. Uh, he's given a name. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow of things in heaven. That includes the angels. Things on earth, that's all of us, all human beings and things under the earth. That's everybody that's ever lived. I know people say that they are atheists. I know people say they're agnostic. Uh, but eventually, Everyone is going to have to confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. So he has a name that's above every name. Now, I know people walking around here with their chest stuck out, trying to make out like they're somebody, but 
Uh, we can't compare ourselves to one another. We have to compare ourselves to Jesus, and we come up short all the time. So that's why we need to give our allegiance to him. Hebrews 3 and 3 says he was counted worthy of more glory than Moses because he that builds the house is more than the house. So the Jews, uh, they, they thought the world of Moses and he, Moses did some great feats. He delivered them from their Egyptian bondage. He led them through the wilderness. God worked many miracles through him. But it was God that was working through Moses. He that builds a house. God was the one who was uh, working the miracles. He, he just used Moses as a vessel. God made Moses. So you cannot put, if a man builds a house, you cannot make the house more intelligent than the man that built the house. So that's what he's saying. He has preeminence over Moses. I know you think a lot of him because uh, he did a great, great things for the nation of Israel, but it was God that was working through Moses. So he was able to declare, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and I am the last. So he has preeminence over all things. In this chapter, in the 15th verse of the first chapter, through the, uh, it says, uh, Christ was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things created, all things were created by him and for him. And then verse 17 says, for he is before all things and by him all things consist. Verse 18 says, for he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in that in all things he may have preeminence. Verse 19 says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all, all the fullness dwell. So that sums up that he created everything. He's above any power. Uh, he is the head of the church. Uh, he is above all things. He's the firstborn of them who died and have eternal life. So we need to make sure that we keep Christ first. He deserves our first. He said, "He that seek first the kingdom of God and all this righteousness and everything we need will be added unto uh, us. A second principle that was discussed in this book that I think is important for us to consider is reconciliation. This shows us how we as sinful mankind can have a relationship with the Holy God. Uh, we continue with this uh, chapter. At verse 9 says again that, uh, verse 19 says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all foolish dwell. Verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or in heaven. Verse 21 says, And you that were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked, wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. So we are reconciled. We got lost because of sin. 
but Christ reconciled us back to the Father. We were alienated. We, had, we once could have a pure relationship with God. God was able to walk among Adam and Eve before they sinned. But when they sinned, they hid themselves and made fig leaves. And, and God could, not, could no longer commune physically with them because and they lost their purity. So we needed someone to reconcile us. In other words, make peace between God and us. Let's dig into that a little bit further. First, first Corinthians 5 and 18 says, All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Through Jesus Christ, and we have been reconciled back to God. If, if you remember that Christmas story that we recite every year, he met shepherds in the field that night. And he said, unto you is born in the city of Bethlehem a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He said, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So Christ came to make peace between God and man. See, see, God is a God of justice and he has to punish sin. So that put us in a bad condition. If we didn't have a savior, we would have to pay for our own sin, but Christ became our perpetuation, our substitute. And God took his anger out on Christ Christ became that perfect sacrifice. And God reconciled us through Jesus Christ. Christ atoned for us. He paid the price that we were supposed to pay. So because we accept Jesus Christ, we can have reconciliation. God can claim us. God, We can stand before God because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered our sins. Verse uh, Ephesians 2, 15 and 16 said, He abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinance, to, him, to make in him one man, so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body of the cross, having slain enmity. Verse 18 said, through him, we both have access by one spirit unto God. So our sins made us be enemies to God. But Christ took care of it for us. Uh, Hebrews tells us that it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. We sinned in the flesh, and we needed somebody in the flesh to pay the price for our sin. So that left us in a bad situation because when Adam sinned, we all became sinners Sin passed down from Adam. You don't have to teach a baby how to sin. Uh, David said, I was conceived in sin. I was shapen in iniquity. The Bible said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray and we've all turned to our own way. Uh, but God has laid on, on Jesus the iniquity of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. We were healed spiritually because Jesus Christ reconciled us by his blood. So that's something that we ought to really appreciate 
and, and we didn't we didn't need to pass over that too quickly because so many times people have said the myth that I, I hope my good will outweigh my bad. I hope I'm going to heaven. If you really been saved, if you know you didn't just join the church, but you've been saved and you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, his blood has been applied to your life and you have access to God through Jesus Christ because he reconciled us back to God. He redeemed us from destruction. So, since we've been given such a great blessing, we ought to appreciate him. Christ, now the law made us all be sinners. It pointed out that we were less than what God desired. And so we, it made us be without excuse, but Christ, through what he did for us, abolished the strength of the law. In this chapter, uh, the second chapter, in the 14th verse of Colossians, it said, uh, he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took them out of the way, nailing it to his cross, having spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in in them. And he, he tells us, he goes on to tell us to let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect to a feast day or new moons or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. What are you saying here? Those laws they, they, they told us God's desire for how we ought to live. But we couldn't be saved by the law. We just said uh, there's none righteous. We've all sinned, come short of the glory, glory of God. The Bible said that our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's eyesight. Any lie that we ever tell, any bad thought that we ever think, Without a Savior, it's enough to condemn us to hell. So Christ fulfilled the law. What do you mean fulfilled? It means that he, we needed somebody in the flesh to redeem us. So Christ came in the flesh. He's God's only begotten son. He wasn't born by another man. Uh, the Holy Spirit came up on Mary, who was a virgin, and, and she conceived the Son of God. And then Christ came in the flesh. He could be tempted just like anybody else. He was all God and all man. Uh, so he lived a perfect life. He didn't sin. So he, he became a lamb without a spot of blemish. And so what this says is that he, uh, because he fulfilled the law, because he re fulfilled the requirements of the law, God accepted him as a perfect sacrifice. So he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances. He nailed that law to the cross with him. In other words, he killed the law. Doesn't mean that there was anything wrong with the law. All these different things, you cannot do anything. You cannot earn salvation. The Bible said God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, God gave us this gift. Uh, we didn't earn it. You know, some people want to say that it, it's the food that you eat that's going to save you. Some people say it's the day that you worship that's going to save you. All of these things that the, the Jews observed, God had them to observe these rules, these regulations, these feast days, all those things. He had them, he was telling a story about how he was going to redeem them. He was bringing to them 
a consciousness of their sinfulness and their need for a savior. All those were a shadow of the things to come. Right now, uh, by this light that's in my face, I'm casting a, a, a shadow. But that shadow is not who I am. When you go outside and the sun is shining brightly, uh, there's a reflection of you uh, because the sun is shining on you. But that shadow is not you. So all of the, the laws and the ordinances and the uh, feast days and how you eat and, and what you drink and all those things were a shadow, but Christ is the body. So we cannot let anybody judge us. We cannot earn our salvation. It is a free gift to us through Jesus Christ. That's why I wanted to go back over this. We don't want to pass over this. We need to understand why we are saved. But then in the third chapter, since God has given us this, uh, we ought to, out of appreciation, live our lives for him. He died for us, so we ought to live our lives for him. In the third chapter, it said, if we be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand. Set your affection on things above and not things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. But then he says in verse 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are on, upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience, in which ye also once walked when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off in these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing ye have put off the old man in his deeds. So we have been given salvation because Christ died for us. So, and then he said that we are already risen. Risen with Christ. Oh, for, I used to hear old lady say, I, I'll die and I won't have to die anymore. Well, she was right. So we ought to want to live for Christ. We ought to want God to be pleased with us. We're not trying to live right to be saved, but we ought to try to live right because we appreciate what God has done for us. We're God's children now. And he said that one, if you continue to live in sin, God has, he said, the wrath of God has come upon the children of disobedient. Those that he loved, he'll chastise. And, and so I wanted to lift these principles up. Uh, over in Romans, the third, 13th chapter, he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no, no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians 5 and 16 said, walk in the spirit. This is how we can do it. This is how we can, we, we, we've been given the spirit of God living inside of us. He said, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't say that you won't have lust and you won't sense lust. But if you, if you stay in the spirit, if you kill the flesh and feed the spirit, uh, you have the strength to uh, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 Peter 2 and 11 said, abstain from fleshly lust." which wars against your soul. So we are in a war. And in the flesh, you cannot win this war. That's why we need to walk in the spirit. You need to read the word. You need to study. You need to pray that God will give you the strength. And he will. He's not going to tell us to do anything that he won't empower us to do. But we have to call on him. We have to follow him that, he, that we might find strength to do what he has called us to do. <clears throat> that finishes 
our series of studies in this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. I wanted us to not walk away from it so fast. I want to make sure that we are we seal this in our spirits that we might be pleasing to God. And by way of announcements, we're going to continue virtually uh, doing our Bible class on Wednesday evening because it's too dangerous for us to assemble uh, in a small space. We want to make sure that we keep ourselves safe. On, on Sunday morning, we have Sunday school virtually too, just like we were when we were in the building. And then on morning service, this gives us a chance to come back together in fellowship. We uh, come, going back in, We're back in our building. We want you to wear a mask, safely distance, that we might be able to protect ourselves. And I want to advocate that you, if you've not taken your vaccination, please do that. We want to be able to come together safely. Been in the graveyard too many times, and I want to make sure that we have the best opportunity. We have to protect this vessel that God has given us, and he has given us, uh, given scientists the knowledge to protect us from this virus. So please, I love you. God loves you. So please take that vaccination so you won't get sick and you can be able to continue to do what God would have you to do. Let us pray. Holy and everlasting Father, our Redeemer and our Creator, the one that gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ, we thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. And we thank you for the principles that you shared in this study. We ask you to seal this in our hearts that we might be appreciative for what you allowed us to have through Jesus. We're praying for the church as a whole, Father. Lord, we ask you to give us strength to be the vessel that you can use during this time in the history of the world. Enable us to reach out to those who are lost, Father, and you, ask, and you work through us that they might come to a saving knowledge of you. Praying for those who are sick, Father. Help us to be your hands and your vessels to encourage those who are sick. And Lord, we ask you, Father, to enable us to encourage one another. And Lord, we thank you for you saving us. And we thank you for living in us. Thank you for giving us eternal life. We pray this prayer in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God richly bless and keep you is my prayer.